Thank you for joining us. We're live now. Thank you. Welcome to this edition of Emigrate Open Day. I would like you to just pop in the chat. I would like to use that to make sure you can hear me. Uh, why are you here today? What are your expectations? We would like to know what that is uh, so that we make sure we focus on some of these expectations we see in the chat. And of course, the ones we saw in the Emigrate community. You can pop that in the chat. Also pop in the chat if you can hear me. Thank you, welcome. Thank you for joining us on this edition of Emigrate Open Day. We'll be focused on the UK global talents in this edition of Emigrate Open Day. As you know, Emigrate, Emigrate as a community, we focus on tech-enabled visa opportunities from all over the world. So we are talking the UK, US, Canada, France, and several other countries of the world who have made one visa type or, or the other available particularly if you're in tech, particularly if you are globally attractive. And um, Emigrate focuses on these visa types. We help people find out about them. We help people qualify for them. We help people be inspired to even think about those specific visa types. We understand that some people, when they hear the words exceptional, when they hear the word uh globally attractive highly sought after sometimes they discount themselves to say it's not them that you're speaking about so yeah please pop in the chat if you can hear me pop in the chat if you can see my screen also pop in the chat your expectation for this session today our coach for the evening uh is already in the room also thank you so much for joining us our coach for today and he will be sharing with us a lot of information around his own personal journey and several other things around that. Welcome, this is Emigrate and this is Emigrate Open Day. We focus on tech-enabled pathway to relocation and settlement. Today we will be focused, as I mentioned, we'll be focusing on move to the UK as a global talent. We'll start by me sharing just a bit of information around what emigrate is and what emigrate is not. We have a couple of bonuses for this session today. We have a few technician visa resources that are free that you may want to take a look at and you may want to take advantage of. If there's time much later as well, after question and answer, we may have time for an emigrate open consultation session. Also, if you wait till the end, we have a gift for, our, for members of our community. So if you wait till the end, uh, you'll find out about that. Also, we have some information around how you can move to the UK in three to six months as well, using a specific visa type. And so yes, we have a packed edition today where we'll be covering several things. And so let's just jump right into it. I would also mention that we have a bunch of videos that we've done over the last couple of months around different tech-enabled visa pathways around different countries who are trying to attract professionals, talents to their economy. Canada, US, France, Germany. We spoke about the Australia Global Talent at some point. Uh, we did the five tech-enabled routes to relocation and we picked one visa type per country and several others like that. Today, we are focused on move to the UK as a global talent and our coach for the session today is Tunde Adeniro, who is a product leader and is also a UK global talent. Soon, we will be having a couple of sessions. We would have a session focused on the UK startup visa very soon. We would have a, a session which we're having right now on move to the UK, and we have a session coming up as well around move to the US as a global talent. Emigrate is built around a keyword, which is become globally attractive. We're focused on tech at the moment. And for us, when we say globally attractive, we are either speaking about a globally attractive tech profile or a globally attractive tech enabled business, usually a startup. The visa and the different visa types that we talk about is really just a side effect of this objective. Our point is that if you are globally attractive, you would have options. You will qualify for all sorts of visa types. You can decide to stay in your own country. You can decide to relocate as an expatriate to several countries of the world. 
But the key point is that because you are globally attractive, you have several options. And that's what Emigrate helps you to do. We've got services that covers things like information sessions, general inquiry, coaching, and holding, and several things along that line that you can see on the screen. We basically help you around these different tech-enabled visa opportunities. Also, we operate a freemium model. We are trying to build the Uber for this sort of thing, this sort of coaching, and we operate a freemium model. We do a lot of things for free, but then we do have premium services that you, uh, you would pay for. On the free side, we have things like information and inspiration uh, sessions, things like the Emigrate Open Day that we are attending right now. We've got a free Emigrate community across different social media platforms, WhatsApp, Telegram, LinkedIn, and several others. We have a lot of different introductory videos that are designed to introduce you to different pathways that may be of interest to you. We do the Emigrate Open Consultation. We have a Visa Ambassador Office hour that we currently operate with some of the Emigrate coaches that are on the platform. And also we do some short inquiry private coaching sessions that are free of charge. We are only able to accommodate for now just one private inquiry and short inquiry session per person, usually about 10 minutes. And so something we encourage our community to do is please take advantage of everything else that is available for free before you book the private inquiry session. The reason is because during that session, you will make the best use of your time and the time of the coach by asking questions that are private to you, questions that you couldn't have Googled, questions that are probably not covered in some of the editions that we've done, open days and so on that we've done. On the premium side, we've got the Emigrate Circle, which is a premium community. We've got personalized coaching sessions. We've got Emigrate Premium and several others as well. If you're interested in any of these, uh, what you just need to do is either send an email to the email address on my screen, or you could also just go to the URL that you can see as well. More information about these different services are there. We've also built packages. Um, including technician visa application packages. We have the move to UK in three to six month package, focus on startup visa and UK innovator visa. We've got a package around the move to the US as a global talent. This is focused on the US O1 visa. Uh, the O1 visa is the one that says individuals with extraordinary ability or achievement. Used to be called aliens with extraordinary ability or achievement and several other packages like that. If you're interested, you can take a look at those. Emigrate community exists in WhatsApp, Telegram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube, URLs are on the screen. And we encourage you to ask questions, like, share, comment, and so on, and engage with us. Because the reason why the coaches are dedicating their time is because they want to be of help. They're interested in helping you succeed as they have succeeded, and they are still succeeding. Emigrate is a product or a service of Bincom Dev Center at this point. We hope it will become its own startup in the future. But at this point, it's incubated by Bincom Dev Center. And with Bincom Dev Center, we've got a bunch of other services that may be of interest to you. One of them is the Bincom Global Tech Program, which helps you to learn tech now and pay later. It's built on three key foundations, learn skills, gain experience, and gain exposure in the field of technology. We believe those three things must be happening concurrently at every stage that you are in the field of technology. The program is good for you if you're at beginner level. If you are starting from the beginning and you're looking for a structured program to take you from ground zero to globally attractive, this program is fantastic for you. But also if you're at intermediate level and you realize that you need the right combination of experience and exposure in your portfolio, this program is also good for you. On the experience side, we are the Bincom mentoring platform where we have mentors who have volunteered their time to mentor people um, in our ecosystem. We're also asking for mentors to come on and sign up to that platform. One of the things you realize that you can use to show yourself as globally attractive is by mentoring. But Technician Visa specifically says if you are mentoring, it has to be on a structured platform. The Bincom Mentoring Platform is such a structured platform, and we are 
always looking out for mentors. We're always looking out for people who will dedicate some time to help younger people in the field of tech get to their next level. We've got the labs by Bincom, and this helps you to build a product-led digital technology company with a team. It's a three to six months program. And what we do is we bring about three to 10 people together. Um, you may know some of them, you may not. And your objective will be to create a startup from scratch. The key point, however, is that whatever product you build would have to be used by real life users. It would help with practical learning. It will help as an opportunity to improve your career. It will help as an opportunity to improve your portfolio as, as well. If you're interested, the URL is on the screen and I'm sure it's being dropped in the chats as well. Also, we've got the head onto service. This is only available in the UK for now. And this helps you to land your next role in the UK for now, quicker and faster. It's tech employment and recruiting for individuals. What we do is we help you build the relevant experience that you need in that target country. We help you with connection with tech recruiters. We we'll help you with connections with companies that are able to give certificate, certificate of sponsorship. We help with um, everything that you need basically for you to be able to land your next role in tech faster. That's what the Bincom Air Donta service will do for you. This slide shows some of the visa pathways that are available today across different countries of the world. Many of these visa pathways, we've done emigrate open day sessions around them. And so there are videos available that you can take a look at for you to get more information about these different visa pathways. The one we'll focus on today, however, is the UK Global Talent Visa, the Tech Nation Visa. This screen doesn't show an exhaustive list of visa options that are available from all over the world. It's not even an exhaustive list of tech-enabled visas that are available. This is just to give you an idea that these are opportunities available today, and you may want to do some research about one or the other of them. The lowest common denominator for these various visa pathways is that be globally attractive. If you are globally attractive, you would have options. You would have options of different visa pathways you qualify for. Yes, you would need to package yourself. Yes, you would need to make sure the assessors recognize you as who you are, a talent. Emigrate, we are not asking you to pretend to be qualified. We are not asking you to package yourself, even though you don't qualify to be qualified. We're saying that if you are globally attractive and you are qualified, then you have options because many of these visa pathways, they have similar qualification criteria. I didn't say they have the same qualification criteria, but they have similar qualification criteria. There are different visa opportunities, but for Emigrate, we focus on those that will help you to a pathway to settlement, Different some visa types like the UK startup visa may not have a direct pathway to settlement, but we focus on a way where you can find a pathway to settlement with these different visa types. We focus on pathways where you can move with your families, and we focus on pathways where even beginners can plan for it. And that's one of the questions we get asked a lot to say, oh, I don't yet qualify for this particular visa that you are talking about. What we think you should be doing is that you should be planning and you should be working towards qualifying. And we'll, you will hear more about this during this session today. We'll be, uh, our coach is already in the room. Uh, Tunde Adeniro is a product leader, is a UK global talent, and he's going to be sharing with us around this journey. He'll be sharing some advice for the community. He will also be sharing with us so, some information that you may not also be aware of. Uh, as I mentioned, um, if you have questions, please drop them in the chat. If you wait till the end of this session, we have quite a number of freebies for you. We've got a bunch of resources that may be useful for you, particularly if you want to apply for the Tech Nation visa, the UK Global Talent visa for the field of digital technology. We have information for you if you're interested in moving to the UK within a space of three to six months. And if we have a bit of time during the session today, we would have time for open consultation session. For our open consultation session, you would need to have your camera on because we are unable to spotlight you if you do not have your camera on. 
Also, please understand that this session is being recorded. And so please don't share any information that you don't want to see in the public domain. That being said, our coach for the day, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your presence. And um, you'll be able to unmute shortly. Yes, so you can unmute yourself now. And thank you for joining us. We do appreciate your presence. And um, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Bade. Thank you for having me. Um, it's really a pleasure to, it's a pleasure and it's, it's been a long time coming. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here. And uh, it's, it's really good to see all the names that have made it to today's call. Um, yeah, my, my journey has been an interesting one so far. Um, Buddy, how do you want this to work? Do you want to go into Q&A now or I just share my experience? No, we'll, we'll just let you share your experience for about 20 minutes or so and some of the talking points you prepared and then we'll go into Q&A right after. And for the audience, um, if you have questions, we ask that you drop it in the chat immediately because uh, we may not have time later in the session. Okay, sounds good. Um, thank you once again. Um, I think it, it's been a very interesting journey um, for me personally, um, not just me, actually, me and my family. Um, I learned about the Global Talent Program a while back. Um, I think I, I, I saw it on a YouTube ad, actually, um, just randomly on the internet. And then a couple of months down the line, a friend mentioned it to me. I'm like, okay, yeah, this sounds interesting. Let's look into it, right? And then um, I looked into it and the first thing that happened was I got a bit uh, worried, you know, when you hear global talent, it almost sounds like you have to be like Einstein or like you have to have had some patents or you have to be like somebody who is like really high up there, right? Um, but this was me in uh, Lagos, Nigeria at the time. And I'm wondering, okay, do I really actually qualify for this? Um, but I think one thing that really helped me was um, <clears throat> what I learned early on in the process was, it's not necessarily about who you are as a person, is more about what you've done, right? Um, when you look at the, the requirements in detail, what they're interested in is how much impact have you had to society and, <clears throat> how much impact have you had to the technology space as a whole, right? To so the digital tech space or to the world of arts, if you are inclined in that world. And provided you can prove to them that you've done things to sort of add to the body of knowledge of digital technology, or you've helped people become something in the world of digital technology, you actually stand a good chance. Um, so I, I started out the journey by, you know, just reading through the requirements, you know, and honestly, it takes a, a good amount of time just trying to understand what they mean by certain things and, you know, what kind of documentation do you have to share, you know, because nobody's going to talk to you to interview you, right? They're not going to ask you questions. It's basically, you go to a website, you read all the instructions that are on there, you put together a collection of documents and then you submit those documents and of course they are charging you for the privilege of reviewing your documents and it's quite a hefty sum so you send the documents across and then you pray that the person that reviews your documents sort of like uh, agrees that you are a global talent right so it's 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 quite a very interesting process because if you don't have anybody to put you through or to explain things to you you can actually miss it um, and that's why Platforms like this are actually very important, you know, so that, you know, you can ask questions and you can gain some, some clarity as to, you know, what specific sorts of things, you know, are they looking out for? Yeah, so um, I read about the program and for me, my application process was quite extensive because I was busy with work and I honestly did not have time to like really focus on it, right? So it was just something I would just do on weekends. Um, on, on Saturdays or Sundays, you know, just spend like an hour trying to like understand what these guys really want. And, you know, what you would later find out is that it's very intensive, right? So you need like letters, you need people to vouch for you, to write letters for you. You also need to, in several cases, you know, give details of the specific things that you have done in the past, right? So have you been a part of the mentorship program? Bade mentioned the Bincom mentorship program, which is a structured mentorship program. That's actually one of the 
things that they look out for, right? If you've ever been part of a structured mentorship program, you need to be able to evidence that, right? Which then becomes the other aspect of the challenge, right? Um, it's not just you telling them, oh, I've done this, right? Because anybody can package that, right? You can package, oh, I've, I've created an app that had, that generated 1 billion naira or that had 1 million downloads. You can put all those things in documents. However, they verify every single thing you mentioned to them, right? And as much as possible, whatever it is that you're presenting should be things that you cannot, um, you cannot lie about because they can verify when they go online. So if, for example, you say you built an app and the app generated a million downloads, there should be a link to a Google Play Store um, link to the app where you can actually verify that million downloads. And um, that's one of the, the tricks I learned during that process. Um, it's not necessarily about what you tell them. It's really about what information can they find about you online. And I think that's, that's an area where a lot of people who would ordinarily qualify for these sort of programs are, are being uh, held back, right? Because, uh, for example, you Google your name, what kind of information do you see about you? Um, have you been in any like speaking engagements? Have you been in any, have you had any opportunities to share your knowledge and, and, and speak? Um, if you don't fall within that um, bucket of being visible online or having like a decent online presence, you would struggle. Um, for me, I was a, a bit on the lucky side because over the years, I, I just am a bit passionate about um, attending sessions like this where um, I just share my knowledge. I talk to people about product management, which is like my, my career path. Um, I mentor people, you know, I have speaking engagements, uh, I do some training sessions as well. And, you know, I was just doing those things, you know, just out of, you know, just that passion for, for sharing knowledge, right? But interestingly enough, it's paid me back um, for this program, right? Because, you know, as at the time when I was beginning to think about, okay, have I ever done a mentor reception? All I just need to do was, needed to do rather was, to go into my email and uh, search and, you know, I was able to bring out certain things, you know, um, I had done a couple of interviews as well on, on different platforms on TV and stuff. Um, so it, it all sort of nicely played together, um, but that's not all of the story, right? So even if you have those things, you need to be able to tell a, a very good narrative around like why you want to come to the UK in this scenario, right? What sort of impact are you looking to, to, to make in the UK? What sort of um, 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 uh, innovation or knowledge or capacity are you bringing? They don't want people to just come and take the, their jobs really. They are looking for, ideally they are looking for people who are so skilled that, you know, they create jobs, they, they are entrepreneurs uh, or they join startups, right? And then they help those startups scale, right? So that's typically, those are typically the kind of people they are looking for. So if, for example, you run your own startup, um, I think you stand a very good chance, especially if your startup has started gaining some traction. Now, even if you don't run your startup, but you work in a startup kind of environment, you also stand a good chance. Um, the kind of people they are looking for for this sort of program is, you know, you need to work in a digital technology company. Um, it needs to be product driven as against it being a consulting type of environment or it being a service uh, based type of environment. I see pressure is raising up a hand, uh, but the questions are till later, right? Or do we take questions? Yes, now? questions will be till later. And then we prefer questions dropped in the chat rather than at this, at this stage. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Uh, so Precious, if you could just hold off on your question for a bit, um, we'll get to you. So as I was saying, um, they're basically looking for people who are going to come to the UK and make an impact, right? And I didn't really think strongly about this until we had, you know, one of the alum alumni meetups, right, um, here in the UK. And then I met some of the Tech Nation people, right, from all across the world, from the US, you know, strangely, people are coming from Silicon Valley in the US to the UK. I do understand this, but, you know, talking to them, they're very excited to be in the UK. You know, people from Russia, from uh, Belarus, from Australia, you know, from all over the world are coming to the UK for this program, right? And 
you know, one of the things that I discovered that was a commonality across all of them was the fact that these people were people who were making a difference in their fields. You know, however little you might think of it, you know, you had people who, you know, um, are driving a niche uh, technology in the health space, you know, things like AI and stuff. You know, you had people who were startup founders who were trying to grow their business. You had people who had worked for startups for like five to 10 years who had seen startups grow from that ideation phase to like raising, you know, uh, series A, series B, series C. And honestly, I think, you know, it, it's a very strategic move by the UK government because post Brexit, right, it's not so easy for um, Europeans to come into the country anymore like before. And um, what they've decided to do was you know, to open up the country you know, to this talented set of individuals from across the world so that they can then come in and, and grow the economy. So back to my application process story, right? So um, I put together my evidences and you know, I luckily I was able to rely on things like email, things like YouTube in, in cases where like I had participated in events and those events were still online. I was able to get the links to them. But I think the, the place where I struggled quite a bit was, you know, how do, how do you stitch all these different pieces together to tell a story about you, right? Um, one of the things that sets uh, us apart culturally, right? Um, if, if I'm going to share some knowledge that you won't see online is as a typical Nigerian, we don't like, we don't like communicating our wins, right? Where we, if I'm being honest, right? I think to a large extent, we can be modest um, for several reasons, uh, maybe spiritual in the sense that people are like, nah, I don't just want to be too loud so that my village people don't hear that I'm succeeding. Um, or <clears throat> I don't want to be too loud so that um, people don't get jealous of my wins, whatever it is, right? I think generally speaking, you know, you do something and you're like, yeah, it's just a normal thing, right? But when you compare the culture, the behavioral tendency of uh, the people here, um, it's very different, right? They do something really small and like, man, when they explain what they've done, it sounds very nice in your ears, but you don't remember that you've done this thing like several years ago, but it didn't feel so special to you. And you're wondering why, right? So that holds back a lot of people, right? From, you know, being able to look in what's to say, actually this thing, I actually qualify for it, right? Because you know, you, you will just presume that some of those things you did, you know, you just did it. It was a, it was a one hour call with like 50 students of being in lag and you just train them and you just go to it And, it's, you know, it's just a normal thing because, you know, it's something I do or you, you, you mentor some kids in, in church or whatever. You just think, think about it as, as, as being uh, so trivial. Um, but, you know, if you're able to cross that barrier, what it would help you do is you would then be able to tell a story, right? One of the things that you would see um, in the requirements is that any evidence you're going to present has to be from the past five years, right? And the reason for that is they want to see that you have some kind of track record, right? So you cannot acquire all of your evidence within the past six months and then just apply. You won't get it, right? It's, 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 it's a game of uh, patience, right? Um, it has to be layered over time over a period of time. I don't know what the magic number is, but there is more experience in that area than I am. But I'm very sure that you cannot present evidence criteria over the last six months and you'll get it, no, right? They want to see that, you know, this person started out his journey in tech in so and so year. The person had a mentorship session with some people in so and so year. The person had a speaking engagement in so and so year. The person wrote an article or did something nice in so and so year. And basically they want to see that gradual progression over a period of years so that they then get that confidence that okay this person is actually you know not uh, faking it right and uh, trust nigerians i've got seen a couple of questions around you know can you package this thing for me you know can you just help me just do it you know people just think you know this is like just a normal visa application where you know you, you are single but you just Tiki, I'm married, and then they'll just give you the visa. Nah, it's very different, right? It's very different because even before you get the opportunity to apply for the visa, somebody has to review your profile, somebody has to review your story, and then that person has to be convinced that you're actually a global talent, right? So you need to be able to craft that story about you, whatever the story is, right? Um, you need to be able to sell yourself, you know, and that's something that 
culturally we also don't like to do but you have to learn it for for these these uh, 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 sort of scenarios as the global talent visa insert yourself strongly sell the various things you've done in the past and you know basically put your best foot forward now um i applied and interestingly enough the first time i applied i didn't get it um during the q a I, I think myself and buddy can talk a bit more about that but i didn't get it the first time i applied um, and then uh, I know the reasons why I didn't get it, but then I was able to fix um, those issues. Um, it, and to be very honest, it really centered around, you know, I still had that Nigerian mentality where, you know, they ask you for evidence. All I just did is I just took like links to YouTube, put it there, links to different platforms, websites where I was appearing, just dumped it there. And then I just submitted it. Now, my second application, honestly speaking, it was the, 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 the pinnacle of who I was didn't change and what I had done, it didn't change. What was fundamentally different was I had learned to now start crafting really nice stories around like how I'm very passionate about training people, I'm passionate about mentoring people, you now to make a difference in their lives. And more importantly, they want to see what kind of impact have you made. So those people you've mentored, like what's happened to them, right, or, 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 since you mentored them. So I, 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 unfortunately, I left that the hard way, right? Unfortunately, because I wasted the application fees the first time I applied, but I was able to like pick up from that uh, um, disappointment, and you know, I fixed those issues. You know, verbosity is your friend in this kind of scenarios, right? So you you just need to just talk and talk and talk and type and type and type and you know, create that really nice narrative. And one thing I actually discovered that really helps is you having a body, right? Um, having somebody who you guys are chasing this thing together or somebody who has done it already and the person can sort of serve as a uh, guide for you, right? Simple things as help me read this document. Does it make sense? Um, what do you think about me when you read this document, right? It, it's very critical because, you know, you might think that what you've written is like really nice, it's really explanatory, but somebody else reads it and the person just picks out something that you never thought was missing in that document. Or maybe you've come, you, you've sold yourself in a, in, in a way that you didn't think you were selling yourself in just um, unconsciously. So it's really important for you to have a body, right? That can help you sense check the things you put in your your evidence criteria before you go ahead with the submission again it's a very expensive process so you need to ensure that you know you are putting your best foot forward at um, every given point in time so anyways um i i did the second round of applications i submitted it and um after a couple of days i got an email saying you know you had been endorsed and i was like is this real like it was a shock to me because honestly, I didn't, I wasn't so sure if I was going to get to the second time or not, right? I just left it as one of those things where, you know, if you get it, you get it. If you don't get it, you don't get it. You know, life just moves on because, you know, you don't want to be too disappointed, right? But when I got to the second time, I was like, oh, wow, this is real. And then, you know, the countdown clock started, you know, once you get the endorsement, you have about three months to apply for the visa. Once you get the visa, you have about three months to relocate, you know, and then relocating to the UK, there's just a very long list of things that you need to do to settle in. You know, you need to get a place. If you're moving your family, you need to figure out all that part out. And, you know, it's just a roller coaster of, you know, your life just fundamentally changing, right? Um, and and it, it, all in all, I would say it was a, it was a very enlightening experience and a very interesting experience because one of the things it's taught me is um, I can be sleeping and you wake me up and if I need to sell myself, I'll sell myself, right? Just because that experience has forced me to think about all the things I had done over the last several years, you know, and, you know, put them into about 10 documents or so to send across to, to the UK government. Okay, I think I'll take a pause at this time. Um, yeah, but did you have anything to add, Jose? Uh, well, so I, I think the audience would like to know, um, and I will mention to the audience again, if you have questions, please uh, drop them in the chat. Uh, but I'm sure they would like to know around the application process. 
uh, in terms of what documents did you submit? I know you don't have to say the specific document, but if you could describe them, I find that that's usually use, useful for our audience. Okay, sounds good. Um, so the way the, the criteria works is that you have, and I'm trying to juggle my memory here. I think you have one mandatory criteria yeah. and then you have four optional criteria. Mm -hmm. Right so now, choose two. yeah, you have to choose two out of the four optional criteria. Now, in all honesty, when you read the English that they used to craft those criteria, you can get very confused. But I think one of the improvements they've made recently is they've given you examples of documents that you can submit. So if I remember correctly, for the mandatory criteria, they would ask you something like, um, within the last five years, can you provide evidence that you have been recognized as a as a leading talent, right, in the world of digital technology, right? Um, there are several documents that you can use for each of these uh, criteria, right? For the optional criteria, there are four. There's one for academic, there's uh, a couple of other ones for like, have you made an impact in the startup and, and so on and so forth, right? But what are the kind of documentations that I submitted? Now, as a standard, what everyone needs to get, you need to get three referees. Right, these are people who ideally should be at your level or above you. Right, in fact, it's preferable if they are above you. By above you, I mean these people should be like CEOs in a digital technology business. Right, you shouldn't get your your subordinate in the office to write a letter for you because that won't carry much weight. Right, and these are people who should be familiar with your work because the letters can get really personal. Right, and in the letter, the the referee would have to state, "This is how I know Tunde. I've known Tunde for so and so years. We met at so and so place. Um, since we met, these are the things I've seen him doing. Even before we met, these are the things I heard he has done. You know, it, and you have about three pages um, of uh, what documents to write for your referee to write all of that information, and most importantly." When all that is written, it needs to sell you. It needs to make sense. It needs to, it needs to seem strong. It needs to seem exciting. It needs to seem like you're yeah, a global talent at the end of the day. So you need to get three people to do that for you. Um, the next thing you need to do is you need to submit about 10 different documents. If I remember correctly, there are about 10 different documents. Now, each of those documents would speak to the three criteria that you've chosen, the mandatory criteria and then two optional criteria that you've chosen, right? So when it comes to um, how do you evidence the fact that you've been recognized as a leading talent? If, you, if you've ever won an award, for example, that's the perfect time for you to take a picture of it and just don't be there and tell them, ah, this is what you did that made you win the award, right? You shouldn't just snap the picture of the award though. Like you have to explain why you got the award and what made you get the award and what impact you know did you achieve to derive the award. Because what I've seen is if you just take a picture of the award and don't be there, they will they will, they will reject you, right? Um, other things you can you can put in there are things like letters from the people that you have impacted. Right so now, I'm not speaking to the leading, uh, recognized as a leading talent one. I'm speaking to like some of the other optional criteria, right? Recognition, so have, recognition or impact. Those are the yes, impact, big. right? So if if you have letters, um, if you can get letters from some of your mentees, you know, in my instance, you know, I I was a, I am a mentor at the Faith Foundation, right? So I've done a couple of uh, mentorship classes and, and things like that. So it was a bit easy for me to get some of those things. But if you've ever, think about it from the perspective of if you've ever made an impact in somebody's life professionally, the person can actually give you a letter to strengthen your application, right? Now, the other things you need to do would then depend on where you fall in. Are you a technically inclined person or are you a business inclined person? So if you're a software engineer, things like, uh, have you made contributions to open source code ever? You know, do you have a GitHub link? Um, have you ever like commented on Stack Overflow or any of those online platforms that basically shows that, you know, you are who you say you are? All those things can follow that evidence. If you're a business inclined person, um, you need to think about if like you've, you've, you have like a professional forum where you've communicated. Have you written like blog posts or articles or newspaper articles 
that has been shared widely? Do you have like a YouTube uh, channel or has anybody ever interviewed you somewhere to share your knowledge to people in the space? Those are some of the things that you would need. And then I think more importantly, you need to then stress the impact that you've made, right? So if you're a software engineer and you've built an application, I'm just giving a random example now. If you've built uh, an application that has been used by a tier one bank in Nigeria, and the application is processing like several billions of Naira, that's a very fantastic example and an opportunity for you to shine and say, you know, I wrote the code that did this, right? And without this code, this revenue would not exist. You know, you need to craft it that way. As a business person, you know, in the same vein, if you're a product manager like myself, have you ever like conceived an idea and then built a product that generated um, X revenue or helped X people's lives? You know, I, I think fundamentally, you need to think about all the instances where you've made an impact professionally, professionally, either to people's lives or to the businesses you've worked with or worked for. And then you need to, you need to document that. Um, so I had the three referral letters. I had the 10 different documents with just different pieces of evidence um, scattered across all those 10 documents. Each document, no more than three pages. And then I had the personal statements. Now, the personal statement is the very, very tricky one because with the personal statement, I think you have a thousand Word. words. And a thousand words is like one and a half pages, if I've been honest, right? And in those thousand words, you have about six to eight different questions that they will ask you that you need to answer, right? So um, wh why are you applying for the visa? Why do you want to come to the UK? What's your plan for when you come to the UK? What sort of impact are you going to make when you come to the UK? And a couple of other questions I don't remember off the top of my head, right? But again, you know, a lot of people say you should write the personal statement last because the personal statement should really embody your entire application. You know, you need to speak to the different things that have been written in the referral letters and the different evidences that we've submitted. And you need to sort of connect the dots for them. You know, um, I suspect that they tend to read the personal statement first, right? Because usually if you read the personal statement first, you can already tell if you are going to approve this guy or not, right? From, from what I've seen retrospectively. Right. But during the application process, you should write the personal statement last so that, you know, if there's anything you want to highlight in the body of evidence, you can do that. If there's anything missing, slightly missing that you want to also communicate in the personal statement, you can also do that. And it's an opportunity for you to sort of explain your, your journey as a professional to the assessor. I didn't mention. Um, so you have an assessor who works with technician. And um, nobody is sure if it's one person or if it's a group of people, no idea. But the panel, let's use that word, would review your application and then they will make a decision on the application. If you get uh, uh, rejected, there's also the opportunity for appeal. But the interesting thing about the appeal process is that you cannot introduce a new evidence, right? So if your rejection was tied to, they will actually give you details as to why they rejected you. I should mention that as well. Now, if it's something that you can explain your way through to say, okay, you rejected me because of so and so, but this thing you mentioned is actually in a document. Maybe you overlooked it. Based on that, you can appeal. But if it's a scenario where they tell you, we don't think a global talent, your evidence is not strong enough, really your best shot is just to, to apply again. Thank you so much for that. I'll just re-emphasize to the audience that you need to show documents. So anybody can write anything, anybody can write any story. So you need to depend more on the documents you are showing rather than just your story. But in some cases, yes, you may have to give a context to the document, which is fine. But what the assessor is looking out to see, and just to answer that question, it used to be a panel, it used to be a group of people, but recently, it seems that you're now getting just one person assessing um, recently uh, to answer that question. But then you want to make sure that they see documentary evidence. What would happen is, yes, they will read your personal statement first, right? And if nobody in the world would lie ever, all they need to do is read your personal statement and then they should be able to decide whether or not they can give you. What they are then expecting to see with your documentary evidence is documents backing up the things, the assertions you've made and so on in your personal statement. Very important is that don't undersell yourself. Don't say we did this, we did this, we did this. Say a lot more, I did this, I did this, I did this, or I did this with my team. 
kind of thing. So you are bringing out your own contribution to the things that you've done and your own contributions to the startups or businesses or projects and so on that has you've worked on. Uh, today, let's talk about the, um, the recommenders. Uh, I know you needed three recommenders. Could you just describe them? You don't have to mention their names, but how, what was their relationships with you? How did you decide the recommenders to use? I know we had to list out a bunch of them before we decided, but uh, could you speak a bit about that? I think at the end of the day, you need to, so what I remember um, I did at the time or we did at the time was like have a Google sheet of people who I had some professional relationships with who I also knew would be willing to vouch for me and people who were C-level executives um, or people who were who would be recognized as industry leaders, right? Because in the same vein, you also don't want somebody who is, uh, for lack of a better way to put it, who is uh, struggling professionally to write to write a recommendation for you, right? This person needs to be somebody that, you know, when the assessor Googles their name, they're like, oh, okay, this person is actually a top guy in his space, right? Whatever the space is. Um, so we, we went through that uh, process of, you know, listing out the, the various people. And I think if I, if I recall, um, I, I chose somebody who I had worked on a software development project with, and it was uh, an American company that uh, had just IPO'd, I think, last year or so. And this is, a, if I mention the name, everybody knows the name of the company. It's a billion dollar company. Um, so I had somebody there who, you know, we, we had a good working relationship. We had done a project together. He, he knew me, we worked closely. And he was happy to write a recommendation for me. Um, the second was with somebody who I'd worked with in the past, right? Um, a senior to me at one of my previous employers. And the reason for that was um, the person was able to, or would have been able to say, okay, I've worked very closely with Tunde in the same organization. You know, Tunde was so so and so person. Um, in this organization, this was his level, and this is the impact um, he was able to make, right? So one of the things I've seen very commonly that people do is if, if, if you've like had several uh, years of experience, which ideally you need to have for this visa anyways, you know, you need, I think you need to have at least minimum five years or so, right? Uh, in that time, most likely you would have changed jobs, right? So you could get like your previous uh, boss to, to write a letter for you. If your previous boss is a C-level executive, for example, um, or you could get the CEO to write for you directly, right? Uh, now, the third one was somebody who we hadn't worked closely together in a, it's a professional setting, but it's not in a work setting, right? It, it was more of, a, what's the way to put it? Uh, a community kind of setting, right? So th this person was somebody like Bade who, you know, has a passion for, for teaching people of certain things, you know, and you know, around product. And um, I had done a couple of like mental mentorship sessions through that platform. Um, I've done a couple of speaking engagements through that platform. Um, so it was very important because it also gives them a very strong idea of, okay, this person is not just making an impact at work, but this person is also making an impact outside of work, right? So if, for example, you have, uh, if you are volunteering, right, for, for a training institute or for, or for a body of uh, an association of product managers, for example, association of business analysts, and let's say you volunteer with them, you, you have uh, workshops regularly, you know, that's very strong because you can then get the organizer of that uh, body to then evidence that to say, okay, I actually know Tunde, this is how I've known him, this is how long I've known him, these are the things he's done, this is the impact he's, he's made uh, to the ecosystem. So I think for me, there was that balance between, you know, getting referees that are directly tied to previous jobs, getting referees that have very strong international exposure and experience and expertise, and also being able to, sh to show that, you know, beyond work, I've also sort of made a lot of impact to, to the local community. Thank you for that. And I would just say that um, in thinking about your recommenders, 
you want to find three different recommenders that can talk about you from three different perspectives. All the different perspectives are probably pointing to the same thing to say you're an exceptional talent or you're an exceptional promise, right? But you want three different perspectives saying the same thing. So it's a bad idea to get three different people in the same company writing about you. They are going to say the same thing. I've seen people say, oh, my CEO, my CFO, and my CTO, all of them wrote glaring recommendations, but it's a zero because ultimately all of them are going to say one thing about the same thing pretty much about you at the end of the day. And for the audience that may not be very familiar with this particular visa pathway, so the UK Global Talent Visa for the field of digital technology is what we shorten as technician visa. And the reason is because the technician Technician is a company, and that's the only endorsing body today for that particular visa pathway. The Global Talent Visa in the UK, there are several options in terms of different fields. So there's one for engineering, there's one for fashion, and so on. But the focus today is the one for technology, which is also called the Technician Visa. For that route, there are two options. And I know today I was talking about a magic number. I can give a bit of an insight into that. There's the Exceptional Talent. To a large extent, you need to have a minimum of five years experience in the field of IT for you to qualify as exceptional talent. There are exceptions if you have four years, if you have three years, but that means that you had some fantastic, I mean, stories and all of that within that time. But generally speaking, minimum of five years, so maybe 10 years, 15 years, and showing a track record over a period of time. Exceptional promise, one to two years is fine, really, because what they want to see is that oh, over that period of time, you've been doing stuff and then they can plot a trajectory that if this person continues in this tra trajectory, this person will become a talent over a short period of time. The new guideline that came out, April, um, I said that April 2022, I said that if you have more than five years experience in the field, you cannot be considered as exceptional promise anymore. So you need to have less than five years experience in the field if you are going for exceptional promise and generally speaking, more than five years in the field for exceptional uh, talent. Uh, before, um, before I go to share some information around some free technician visa resources, and then we'll come back for more questions. Uh, today, could you share with the audience in terms of the visa, why is it said like the global standard in visas? And then what does this visa give you? Yeah, I, I think uh, it's it's the global standard because it's it's not very easy to get. To be honest, um, it's 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 the rejection rates are. I mean, it's it's a very rigorous visa process that you know if if you are not uh, persistent with with it and disciplined with the process, you probably won't just do it. Um, not a lot of people apply for it, uh, as far as I know, um, and. What that then means is in terms of the rejections, the rejections are actually like way better than, than uh, your standard visa rejection rates, right? So when you want to apply for a visit visa. <laughs> but with that being said, right? I think the, the, the acceptance criteria varies per, per country and all that, right? So I think it's, it's very good because it opens up a lot of doors for you. Um, one of the benefits of this visa is when, when you come into the UK, um, for a lot of people who are migrating to the UK, for example, using the student routes, right? What tends to happen is, you know, they need to get sponsored by their employers for them to work, right? But with the Global Talent Visa, you don't need any form of sponsorship from any employer, right? Uh, it gives you a lot of flexibility because with that, you know, you can choose to start your own business. You can choose to work for an employer, um, and by working for an employer, you have more options, right? Because, you know, when you are looking for an employer with sponsorship, it's a very different ball game. It says that your options are limited, right? Because not every employer wants to sponsor, sponsor people on visas because it's an expensive process. But when, when you have uh, no need for sponsorship, you are almost like a citizen in the sense that, you know, there's, there's, there's no sponsorship required. You can work for anybody you like. You can do anything you like, really. You can even school if you want to school. Um, the only two things I think you can't do is you can't work as a doctor and 
you can't decide you want to be a footballer and start playing football, <laughs> right? So, other than that, it, it gives you a lot of leeway and it's a very well respected visa, even here, right? Like when you tell people, you know, you're on a global talent visa. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the tier one visa. The tier one visa is a, like an older category for like very experienced people, right? So even when you talk to people and say on a global talent, they're like, oh wow, that's really nice. It means that you know you 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 know something about digital technology, right? Um, so yeah, it comes with it comes with that that pack as well. Um, but what was the second question again? I missed that. Um, so I think you you covered it already. It was just pretty much what this visa pathway uh, specifically gives you for the benefit of those not familiar with the visa pathway. I will just share my screen now. We'll be coming back to more questions uh, from the audience. And also, if we have a bit of time, we'll be taking one or two questions on the open consultation uh, session. We've been talking with uh, Tunde Adeniro, who is a product leader and also a UK global talent. He's been talking to us around moving to the UK as a global uh, talent. Uh, in terms of emigrate, so the global talent visa requires you to qualify and there are different qualification criteria that you need to have for you to qualify, as I mentioned, for exceptional promise or exceptional talent as well. In, a, uh, in addition to that, which is a pathway that is available, uh, Emigrate recently started what we call the move to the UK in three to six months uh, pathway, which is a beginner friendly route uh, for even people who have zero years of experience in technology. It doesn't focus on the global talents. It doesn't focus on the start in, on the student route. Instead, we focus on the startup visa, UK startup visa, and the UK innovator visa. With the UK startup visa, it doesn't have a direct pathway to settlement. However, you can, within two years, be able to move to the UK and then find a different pathway to settlement. We can advise on that. There's a gate for the UK startup visa, which is you need to find an endorsing body who would endorse you for that UK startup visa. They will need to endorse you and your idea, your startup for the visa, and Emigrate is able to help with that. In addition to that, in terms of the uh, some of the things you need for you to be able to qualify as well, Emigrate is able to help with that. Something we advise is if you've ever considered to say you will move to the UK on the student visa route, this may be a route you want to consider. The reason is because it's much, much cheaper than the student visa route. And also on your day one of moving to the UK, you can work from day one of moving to the UK. With the student visa route, you will need at least, you will do student for one year and then you get post-study visa for two years when you can start working. The UK startup visa route gives you two years but you can start working immediately and it's cheaper to also move on this. If you're interested in that, you can send a WhatsApp message to any of the numbers on the screen and then they can give you more details around this particular route. Also for members of our emigrate community, we are interested in driving higher forms of engagement within all our communities. And so we have a community bonus that we've started, uh, uh, we started, started last month and um, we had the winner last month, but this month we opened it up to say we would have a winner from each one of our communities. And the prize is, is uh, a free coaching session, one hour coaching session, which is worth $700. And that also comes with full membership with the Emigrate Circle. How you can win is for you to like, share, comment on some of our posts, invite friends and colleagues to the Emigrate uh, sessions and every great community generally ask questions and also answer questions that you can uh, I see some of our community members answering questions already and then you can also share useful information around tech enabled visa pathway very important is that we are not interested in just quantity of engagement so don't just um, spam the community instead we are very interested in quality of your engagement and then if you can do a combination of the two that is even better and that this is on all the different instances of emigrate community so whether on whatsapp or telegram or linkedin and every one of the different ones that we do out one of the freebies we promised during this session is uh, some free technician visa free resources that you may be interested in and um, i'll just share some of those 
The first one is the Technician Visa Guide. Um, it's an open guide. It's the official guide from technician themselves around this visa pathway. It will take you an hour to read this if you really want to read and digest this. And we advise that you read it twice. The first time you read it, you can read it like a storybook and all of that. The second time you read it, you want to have a pen and paper and start noting down some of the things you've done that qualifies under that route. Or if you are one of the people that are planning for the future, maybe in six months, in one year, then you need to start noting down some of the things you can do for you to qualify. Second resource is there's the technician discuss channel, which is run by different technician visa alumni. It is a very, very useful forum where you can ask questions and different visa alumni. These are visa alumni are people that have gotten this visa specifically. And some of the visa alumni are also emigrate coaches anyway. They are able to answer your questions. They are able to give their opinion. They are able to give you direction and so on. Uh, take a look at that URL. You can read some of the conversations that has gone on in the past, and you can ask your own question on this channel as well. Technician Office themselves also started the Understanding the UK Technician Visa events. It is changing form now, but this is something you should look out for as well. This is the third free resource. And with this forum, you can get access to the Technician Visa office and the guys that run the technician visa and you can ask questions you can understand the visa better and you can also speak with different visa alumni and visa ambassadors our final resource is the ambassador um office hour we do this for about 30 minutes every tuesday at the moment the url is on screen so if you need some it's an open session but it's focused on and it's not recorded, it's focused on the technician visa. And we always have at least one emigrate coach uh, who is a technician visa alumni on that channel at that time where they can answer questions, take a look at document, whatever it is that you need to you need at that point, it's also available. And this is also free of charge. For those that have gotten the endorsements as well, congratulations. There are a few things that are maybe useful for you. There's the Technician Visa Alumni Community. There's a community on Slack, which is the global alumni from everybody from different countries. We advise that you join that. It's on Slack and on LinkedIn and on Facebook, but the Slack one is the most active of all of them. It's strictly for visa alumni. And we advise you join because there are many questions that you can ask along the lines of the next stage, applying for stage two, applying for ILR, and so on. Also, we've, we're operating emigrate community around different countries. And so there are a bunch of emigrate coaches and emigrate community questions like, how do I open a bank account? How do I register the GP and so on? Which are some of the things that you will need to then start dealing with? How do I get a job and so on? Um, th this is a resource that may be helpful for you. Also, we have a document that is going on the technician uh, page actually, which is called Welcome Party. And it basically just details a bunch of things that you need, particularly for your move to the UK. If you're interested in any of those, you can ask for them on the Emigrate community. Also from Emigrate, if you need help with your technician visa endorsement application, uh, we advise you can talk to us. It starts from free. Uh, we, we do 10 minute sessions for free at the moment. And what you can do with that starting, and then of course we do have premium um, services and premium coaching packages for the technician visa uh, application as well. We also have, uh, we also help with endorsement review process. So if you've been rejected and you need help with the endorsement review, we can help with that. But it starts from free. And what it is, is that it can give you direction in terms of what should I be looking at well, how should I package my application and so on? If you're interested in that, you can book for that session as well with the URL on the screen. Uh, so yes, so th those are some of the things we wanted to just um, touch on at the moment. And then we'll be going back to today now to continue our question and answer um, session. Um, yeah, so today on the chat, somebody was asking around uh, visa cost. You can Google that. So please, let's move on to the next one. Oh, yeah. So someone says, you mentioned about Menti writing a letter for you. 
was the letter written collectively or by just one mentee? And if possible, can he highlight what the mentee talked about? Uh, yeah, so um, in, in this instance, it, it was just one, uh, one mentee writing one letter. I, I would put it that way. Um, so I would advise um, that unless you have like a bunch of mentees who are like working for the same startup or something, right? You just get one person to, 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 to one mentee to write one letter and then you can get multiple mentees to write multiple letters. But this particular mentee is uh, somebody who I had known for quite some time and somebody who, who's, who's actually running a, a startup. Um, he has an online business. And um, over the years, I'd sort of like given him a lot of ideas into like different ways he could make more money, he could position his business online and he could monetize his business, right? Um, and one of the things he wrote in, in the letter was, you know, Tony hasn't been working for us officially, but, you know, I've followed him closely throughout my journey as the CEO of this startup. And he's, very, he's been very instrumental to the success of my startup, right? These are some of the ideas that he shared. These are some of the things he's done for us. And these were the results, right? So basically, that's really how your mentee should structure the letter. And ideally, it, it, you want somebody who, you know, can state the impact of your mentorship, right? So it could be somebody who, for example, you mentored two years ago, the person was still thinking about something. And then based off of some of the things you told them, the person has done it now and there's some results, right? And the person can actually say, oh, based on this person's inputs, these are the results that I've got that I've gotten. Yeah. So um, important things that you should note from what uh, Tunde mentioned is one, that person needs to be successful by themselves. And that person is saying that it's because of today's contribution to my business or to my life that made me successful is my mentor. So that's important. Second thing is that your mentee writing would not be one of your three recommendation letters. It would be an additional supporting evidence so that's additional evidence from people that are saying because your three recommenders you want them to be captains of the industry you need them to be global talents themselves but then this supporting mentees letter could be someone that is already becoming successful maybe the person could qualify for exceptional promise or maybe exceptional talent by themselves but the key point is that by the time they google that person they need to see that oh this person too is coming up and then it's because of the recommendation that is happening. Uh, there's a question here around success rates based on your experience and finding. Success rate for the application at the moment uh, globally is about 50%. Success rate for Nigeria specifically is about 30% or 40% from the last data I, I saw, right? So the success rate is lower in Nigeria, but then emigrate success rate is actually at 90% at the moment. So we're really excited about that with people that work with us. So we're doing something well <laughs> around that. So we're really proud of, of that. Um, first time application success around 80%, but then we've gotten a bunch of application on appeal on endorsement review. So we're excited about that. Uh, does this visa cover those in digital media? Um, so I think this person is talking about marketing and um, I think the answer is yes, you can find the, the list out there. Thank you, I'm a tech sales person, do I stand a chance? Uh, today, I don't know if you could speak with this tech sales expert. It says, does it stand a chance? Because this is a business side of tech. Yeah, yeah, so the answer is yes, um, but there's a caveat to the yes, right? Um, I actually know somebody who is uh, a sales professional and uh, she actually got the endorsement with, with, with the global talent. Now, here's the thing. The most important criteria is the organization that you work for, right? It needs to be a product-led organization, now, even if you are doing sales for a product-led organization, you are fine. If you are doing digital marketing for them, you are fine. But if you are working for an agency or a consulting business, if you actually go to one of those free resources that Badi shared, I think they, they, they give examples of what a product-led company is about and then what sort of career paths uh, can fall under that. But based on my personal experience, I've seen... I've actually even seen a doctor that got this thing, right? But he's a doctor in tech, right? I've seen a lawyer that got it. She's a lawyer in tech. I've seen somebody in sales, sales in tech. 
So digital marketing, definitely that has to be in a product-led organization. So short answer is yes, but you just need to be careful around how you present it. Yeah, so very, very important because they need to see you in a product-led organization. If you are working for a consultancy, it's going to be difficult for you to get it. But something we advise in terms of when we do private consultation is that if your consultancy worked on maybe a particular product, so for example, you were working in Andela and then Andela built Flutterwave, for example, then what you want to talk about is that particular product that you built, not necessarily that I work for Andela and then we are just building products for different people. And you want to think about that because the technician visa guy specifically says that you would not qualify if you were working for a consultancy. So being come ICT runs a consultancy, you wouldn't qualify directly, but then because you are building social lender, which is a digital product that is making traction in Africa, then you would qualify. So think about it from that perspective. Uh, can I switch from startup visa to tier two visa while in the UK? Yes, that's what you would need to plan to do because the startup visa does not give you um is not a pathway to settlement and it cannot be renewed so once if you move to the uk on the start of visa then you have to look for the different ways you can move to a different visa type the thing is that it's easier for some of these visa type if you're already in the uk which is why we would say oh yes you can move with start of visa as a stepping stone to other visa type it makes it easier for you to get the tier two visa so if you have um interviews, even if it's virtual interviews and they call your UK line and all of those kind of things, it's easier for you to get a tier two visa that will give you sponsorship. Um, innovator visa, you can switch from startup visa to innovator visa as well. But this session is not focused on that visa type today. We are focused on the global talent visa, which is one of the visa pathways you can switch to from a startup visa, if whether you're already in the UK or you're currently in your own country. Uh, the WhatsApp numbers, uh, you can, I'm sure some of my colleagues will drop the WhatsApp number on the chat, so that will be sent to you. Links to the free resources, that would also be dropped in the chat and will be sent to you. So yes, we have a bit of time for the open consultation session. If you have a question, you can raise your hand using the hand raise feature in Zoom. We cannot uh, spotlight you if you don't have your video on. So we need, require that you have your video on. So that way we can spotlight you, bring you on stage, and then you can ask questions from the coaches, the two coaches that are on this session today. Please bear in mind that this session is being recorded. And so don't share personal details that you don't want to see um, online at the end of the day. Uh, yeah, how can I engage better with mentorship programs? Having a good online presence in the digital industry. So this is a two-tier question uh, today. This person is asking mentoring, how can they do that? And then also, how can I build a good online presence? Yeah, so I think uh, I, I would start with the second one. Building a good online presence, there's a couple of things you can do there, right? Um, probably one of the easiest ways to start is like have a very strong LinkedIn profile. Um, don't be one of those people that, you know, they don't have LinkedIn accounts, right? That's That's very bad. Some people have LinkedIn accounts, but they don't have pictures there, right? Or it's not updated, right? So have a very strong LinkedIn account because that's something that you can do for free. Um, the other thing you can actually also do is you didn't mention the specific uh, field that you're in. Now, there are certain blogs, there are certain platforms that allow you to share your thoughts, right? Medium is actually one of them that you can do for free, right? Um, if you write Medium articles, now the, for the technician, uh, Global Talent Visa, one of the things they've said is you cannot use a medium article as an evidence. However, if it's all about communicating that you've shared your knowledge, right? If you are able to do that, you know, using a blog post or using an article, uh, you just need to find a, a platform. If it's medium you want to use, fine. If your, your career path has like an industry blog that a lot of people visit, you can actually volunteer you know, to share uh, an opinion piece with them and then write about a topic that you are passionate with. Now, the, the long and short of it is when they Google uh, Muhammad Yekini, something should come up about you, right? First is your LinkedIn. And then second is the fact that, oh, you're actually a professional in this industry, either because you've written an article or you've written a blog post or somebody has interviewed you. 
right? Um, and I guess like you, you can also sort of flesh out what I've just said in, in that area. In terms of how can I engage better with mentorship programs? Again, the specifics of this would depend on what role you are in, right? So if you are in sales, just go online and see if there's any mentorship programs for young people who are looking to get into sales or who are looking into, who are even looking to get into digital technology as a whole, right? So right now there's a long list of mentorship programs out there. Now, the thing is for the Technician Visa, it needs to be a structured mentorship program, right? So it cannot just be uh, somebody in your church that somebody just introduces you to say, oh, let me coach this person. And you say, no, that's your mentor. It can't be that because that's unstructured. And more importantly, you need to evidence the fact that the mentorship happened, right? So if you know you go online and you Google mentorship programs for sales experts or for digital marketing experts, I'm very sure you would find something, right? And then on these programs, you can then sign up as a mentor. Now, also don't forget that these people will not just accept anybody as a mentor, right? So before you, you, you put yourself out there to become a mentor, you need to position yourself right. You need to have the right kind of experience. You also need to have some good online presence as well so that when some of your mentees Google you, they are like, okay, this person knows what he's talking about. And you know, you need to, 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 to have a bio. If you don't have a bio, you know, have a, a really nice bio that speaks about your experience, speaks about what you've done. Um, so basically try to sign up to a couple of mentorship programs um, usually they are pro bono, right? So you need to be ready to give um, an hour, two hours of your time per week to some of these things. And then, you know, you then have some evidence that you can you can use further down the line whenever it is you are ready for, for your, your application. Yeah. And also don't sign up on the mentoring platform today and then ask for a, a recommendation letter tomorrow, right? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work that way. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> that, that's a real life experience, by the way. So just, that's why I had to mention that. Yeah. Uh, so now let's speak about products as um, product management and then products as an industry. Um, one of the questions I know, because I mean, I'm going to ask if that you speak with three different categories of people very shortly, but let's just focus for the next one or two minutes on the product management itself, because we do have product managers on board on this, we do have project managers on this session, and they are wondering, one, um, how do I become a product manager? And then second, how do I become a globally attractive product manager? So I would like you to start from, okay, this is base level to say, if you say you're an experienced product manager, this is what we expect to see. And then what sets you apart to say, oh, you are globally attractive, you're a global talent in that field. Yeah, the first question, how do I become a product manager? It's a very simple question, but also very difficult to answer as well. So um, I think the, 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 the very, very first thing you need to do right, is you need to understand what product management is all about, right? Um, and there's a lot of online resources to help you to do that, right? Now, when it comes to uh, real life experience, a lot of people confuse product management and project management, right? A very easy way to look at it is the product manager is basically responsible for the product, whatever the product is. So let's say Zoom, which is the platform we're using for this call is a product. Somebody is responsible for thinking about, okay, what kind of problems do we need to solve with this product? What sort of improvements do we need to solve with this product? The person needs to talk to customers to say, what kind of challenges are you having, right? I remember in the early days of, of COVID, when Zoom sort of took off, uh, there was this issue where people would join calls and then some people would just uh show pornography and all that and it was a huge problem because schools were using zoom at the time and very quickly zoom introduced features where the the moderator can prevent people from turning on their videos right now that is the 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 reaction of the product team you know taking in customer feedback working with the technology team to build a solution and pushing it into the market right now that's a very 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 summarized version of what product management is about now, you need to have that understanding as a first step. The second thing, which is um, can be very challenging, is ideally, I would encourage you to go some for some form of formal training, right? Where you could have like workshops, you know, you have experienced people who would take you over a couple of days. You know, there's a couple of them right now. If you just Google product management training, you would, you would see that. I'm not going to mention names. I don't do free advertisements. 
Um, <laughs> but you know, just go online and Google trainings. You will see that some of them are very cheap as well. So you could you you could do that, and you know, it's really interesting because people like me are on those training programs, right? And then you get to learn like practical things. Now, the third thing you need to do is get some experience, whatever that experience is. Now, this is where a lot of people make the mistake. You know, you want, you're trying to go into a field and you want to end big immediately. You know, you need to sacrifice, you know, you need to get your foot in. Now, what I tell people is, so long as you can show that you have done product management at an organization, even if it's for one year, you are in a good chance to get a better job. What do I mean? Let's say you're looking to get into the field. You could actually sign up as an intern or register or join a company as an intern and you could get paid peanuts for all you care. Just make sure you're you're covering your basic bills, you know, so you could be earning minimum wage. Now, you know that you're you're paying that sacrifice because, you know, number one, you're going to get products associate or product manager or whatever products related title on your CV. And more importantly, once you spent one year in that job, you can then begin to go higher, you know, get higher paying jobs that would sort of then broaden your experience for that, right? So it, it I would say in a nutshell, those are the three things you need to do. One, have a good understanding of what product management is, you know, so that you even see if it's something you like, right? You can watch YouTube videos about product managers. There's a couple of them talking about a day in the life of a product manager. So just watch it and see, you know, if it's something you like, because product management really hinges on your soft skills. You know, you need to have certain soft skills. You need to be able to talk. You need to be able to negotiate. You need to be able to, to, to think about things from a strategic and a tactical perspective and so on and so forth, which I don't have time to get into now. But <laughs> just have that broad understanding. The second thing is, you know, try to do some form of formal training because it would also boost your chances of getting a job when you're applying. The fact that like in the past, I've looked to higher entry level product managers. And one of the things I look out for is, has this person shown an affinity for product management before? You know, the only way I can tell that is if this person has done some form of training, you know, because at the very least that tells me the person has the knowledge. He just needs the experience, right? So get the training done and then just get a job that actually gives you some form of practical experience. Don't really... Don't look for a 500,000 hour job to start out, right? That's That would probably take you longer, even if like you can get it. I don't know if you can or not, but try and start lower. More importantly, get a job that gives, that allows you to express yourself as a product manager and then and then grow from there. Um, so that would be sort of like the three-step approach I would um, share for people who are looking to get into product management. Now, for you to become globally attractive. So, so sorry, to the, so I need to plug in our own advert in there. <laughs> so to describe some things that you can do, one of the programs I would recommend because Bincom runs it is the Bincom Global Tech Program because what we've structured over a one to two year period is you learn the skills, you gain the experience and you also gain exposure in the field of technology. It's a paid program. However, the company is able to allow you to learn now and then you pay later. So most of your fees, you start paying when you start earning the high income in the field of technology. So free advert right there that I had to plug in. So today, how do you now become globally attractive? Yeah, perfect. I think um, you, you need to take intentional steps with, with your career, right? Um, do projects that are novel, right? Uh, jump on products that are interesting, right? So for example, if you ever get a chance to work on something that has to do with Bitcoin or cryptocurrency, those are like the buzzwords of tomorrow, right? Those things are things that are experiences that you can never throw away. They're also experiences that put you at the forefront of things that are, are being done globally, right? Now, when you begin to start your career as a product manager, Right. Obviously, I mean, it's a personal decision if you want to remain in the same company for five years, but I personally wouldn't recommend that. Right. You want to you want to move around, you know, every couple of years just so that you can also have some experience across industries, because all that also builds into your being a globally attractive person. Right. Uh, you cannot necessarily be globally attractive if you worked in one company for the past 10 years. Like, OK, like what have you done? But if you have a taste of different industries, you know, it puts you out there. Now, be very intentional about the kind of companies you work for, right? If you are able to work for a startup, you know, like a Flutter Wave, a PayPal, um, a, I, I've run out of names in my head right now, but, you know, um, a PayPal, but just 
work for any startup. I was working on something. I think the key point is work on things that are novel in nature, right? By novel, I mean things that are innovative, um, uh, innovative things that are uh, ingenious and things that, you know, it's, it's not very common. Um, what I would do for you is it, it gives you the experience in that industry and it also makes you stand out more easily, right? If you have only 10 experts in a certain topic across the world, obviously the 10 of you are uh, experts, right? But if you have like 1 billion experts in a certain topic, then all of you are on the same level. Nobody's an expert, right? Um, and then it's harder for you to differentiate yourself. So gain the experience make smart decisions with respect to your career move by working for the right companies and not just working for the right companies, working on the right products and projects in those companies. So if it means you volunteering to say, oh, this thing you guys are talking about, it sounds very interesting. Can I work on it? Even if it means you're working with somebody more senior, just put yourself out there. It may help you in the future and you may not realize it, but these are the things that you would then need for when you know, you're making your, your global talent um, applications. Now, more importantly as well is you need to be out there, right? I know a lot of people say, oh, I just want to just do my work and then come back home and stay with my family. But at the end of the day, doing that is, is not special, right? What makes you special is have you had an impact, you know, in the field of product management, right? So one of the things that I had to at some point, start doing, even before I knew about global talent, I didn't even know global talent existed, right? Was, you know, I started trying to, you know, speak, you know, when we have uh, product tank sessions, you know, product tank is a global community of uh, product managers. So they have product tank sessions across various uh, aspects of the world, you know, and not just product tank, various communities like that, you know, um, and then that was before COVID. So there were physical sessions and then, you know, we would have a forum like this physically. People would come in, they would ask questions. I'm looking to get into product management and I would answer their questions, you know. And then interestingly enough, you know, sometimes pictures were taken of those events. Sometimes, you know, somebody will write something about it and post it online or somebody would tweet about it and take a video of me while I'm talking. You know, I didn't know that all those things would come back and add up. But I think if you want to become globally attractive, when they Google your name, something needs to come up, right? For me, there's a professor that always comes up when you Google my name, right? <laughs> professor Tunde Adeniro. <laughs> so I haven't literally, or I've not totally gotten rid of him yet because you know he's always in the news and you know, he's a very old man and very, very successful politician in Nigeria. But anyways, you know, if you have a more unique name, you know, that isn't as common as mine, just make sure that when they Google you, you know, something comes up, you know, you have some form of online presence. And really that's that's how you, you can differentiate your, yourself globally. Fantastic. I feel like you've spoken already to beginners in the field and you've also spoken a lot to the intermediate people in the field. I uh, will just be sharing my screen briefly now just to recap a few things. And then we'll be asking you to speak with the experts in the field. I will also, so there are five categories of our immigrate audience. You've spoken to the beginners, you've spoken to the intermediate people, but then I would like you to speak with the advanced people. I would like you to speak with the people who are currently in their different destination countries, but without a pathway to settlement, what can they do? And then speak to the people that are ready to apply for this particular visa type, what are some advice you would have for them? But just before you get into um, speaking to them, I just wanted to do a quick recap of some of the things that we shared just at the beginning of this session. Emigrate, our focus is around you becoming globally attractive. The visa is only a side effect of that objective. We have a bunch of services in Emigrate that covers things from information session to general inquiry, to coaching and holding, to helping you with a roadmap towards you qualifying over a period of time, to helping you with uh, a roadmap for applying, to helping you package your application if you need help with that, to reviewing your application if you're about to submit, to helping with the endorsement review process and all of that. Emigrate operates a premium model, which means we do a lot of things for free, but we do have some premium services as well from information and inspiration session that is free to the emigrate circle, which is premium to, our, um, to some of our customized services around the different visa types that you may be trying to apply for to some of our open consultancy 
consultation sessions and monthly open days, which are also free as well. We do have a bunch of packages uh, now. One of them is the move to the UK in three to six months. We've done open day sessions around this in the past. And our next open day is actually going to be focused around the UK startup visa. Uh, we also have the move to the US as a global talent focused on the US who want visa, amongst other packages that we help with coaching. We do not offer immigration advice. We do not offer legal advice. What we offer is coaching services. What we offer is helping you and holding you, helping with information, inspiration, coaching, mentoring, uh, direction and several other things along that line. That's what Emigrate focuses on to help you qualify for this visa type, to help you plan to qualify and to help you package your applications once you are ready to apply. We have a community and we're building a community around tech enabled visa pathways across different platforms. And we ask that you take a look at that. We ask that you engage with us. Many of our coaches are in these communities. Many of our past clients who have now become coaches are also in these communities as well. And there are many, in many cases, they are happy to answer questions. They're happy to give you direction. Many of that for free. Um, also with Bincom Dev Center, we have the Global Tech Program. I already mentioned this already, but that's the URL in case you are interested. So if you are beginner level, starting from the beginning and you need help, this program is for you. If you are intermediate and then you need experience and exposure, this is for you. Our mentoring platform is available and we have an open call for mentors. Yes, we cannot accept every single person that applies as a mentor. However, we are asking that you apply because it's a structured mentoring platform and it gives you an opportunity to mentor many more people. Labs by Bincom gives you an opportunity to build your own product-led digital technology company with other people who are interested in that. And then with our head on service, it's tech employment and recruitment service for individuals, particularly those in the UK. We help you land your next role faster. It's a form of coaching service, but we also help you build the relevant experience you need in that target country. We help you with connection with technical recruiters. We help you with companies that are able to give you access to certificate of sponsorship, which is what you will need to get a tier two visa and several other things like that for you to be able to land your next role faster, which helps you with the pathway to settlement in the, U in the UK. Lowest common denominator, as I've always said, is that be globally attractive. And if you are globally attractive, you would have option. We also mentioned our emigrate community bonus that is currently on for this month, which is that the most engaged emigrate community member will get access to free coaching. Uh, well, not it's not free. We'll get access to coaching, which is worth $700 on the platform. So that being said, uh, today I'll just ask that you speak to these other audience. So we have people who have advanced level skill in the field of technology. Do you have any advice for them? Yeah, so I, I think you also mentioned the people who, who are ready to apply. So let, me, let, me, let yeah. me start with those guys, right? So you're advanced, you're ready to apply. Um, I think the, the biggest advice I have for you is don't rush your application, right? Um, take your time, be very confident that you know, you are putting your best foot forward. Um, and one of the ways that I would advise you gain that confidence is by getting somebody who is knowledgeable about this to review your application and tell you, oh, this looks good, you can go ahead, right? Because, you know, like I mentioned in the past, you can get caught up in, oh, I think I'm good enough for this. However, but you're not selling yourself in the right way, right? So that's, that's my, my best advice for you. It's, it's, a, it's a bit of uh, an expense that you need to commit to the application process, right? So um, as much as possible, take your time and then put your, your best foot forward and get somebody to review your application. Now, uh, coming down from there, right? So somebody or uh, people with uh, advanced uh, skills, who uh, maybe are trying to make up their minds and all that. Um, I think the, the, the Global Talent Visa is really one of the best things that can happen to you, to be honest, right? Um, it, it, it puts you, it sets you apart and it puts you on a, on a different level. Uh, one of the things that you need to do, right, is try to figure out what your strengths and weaknesses are, right? So your strengths would probably be the easier parts or the easier thing for you to do. So you have X number of years of experience, right? Uh, but think hard on your weaknesses, especially with respect to you being a globally accepted talent, right? Um, does anybody 
know who you are, you know, outside of your organization. You know, I have a lot of friends who, you know, they have 10, 15, some 20 years experience, but you know, they've worked with very few companies and they haven't given anything back to society. You know, they, if, if you go online, you don't say anything about them. They haven't written any um, article or anything like that. And, you know, I think that's something that sets us apart again from uh, um, the guys in the UK and in the US and the advanced countries, because, you know, those guys, you know, they have three, small three, five year experience. And before you know, they're writing a book, you know, about their experience so far, right? But all in Nigeria, the guy has, has done the thing for 10 years and, you know, it's all in his head, you know, but nobody can know what is in your head, even if what is in your head is like really special and world-class. So you need to think about what your weaknesses are as a professional. You know, you've gained this experience over the years, you've gained this knowledge, you know your stuff, but do other people know that you know your stuff? You know, so it might be time for you to start writing articles online. It might be time for you to start putting yourself out there a bit more from a professional perspective. Now, not from a personal perspective, right? From a professional perspective, you know, share your knowledge, share your thoughts, you know, join uh, uh, online blogs, you know, if you're a product manager, you know, there's Mind the Product, right? Which is like a huge online blog for, for product managers. You know, you can volunteer to write an article there. You know, you could join product management related forums and you could post there. There's Quora on there as well, you know, where you can also share your knowledge. You know, so the, the benefit of the internet age is that there's ample opportunity for you to share content, right? Um, I think one of the things that would then set you apart, you know, from an experienced uh, or advanced uh, person to a world-class person is for people to be able to recognize that knowledge and skill sets that you have. And the only way they can recognize it is if you share your knowledge and if you put, put yourself out there. Thank you so much. And then any advice for people already in the UK, not on a pathway to settlement? Um, no immigration advice, we've said that already, so <laughs> you cannot yeah. try to comment. <laughs> this, is, this is not immigration advice, to be honest, but um, I think the, the, the best thing you can do is to do a lot of research as to what the best way forward for you is, right? So, for example, if you're on a student visa, you know, you need to have a mid-term and a long-term plan, right? One of the things that I've realized about the UK is that everything involves planning, right? You can't just wake up today and say, oh, I want to do something tomorrow, right? Um, you have to plan ahead. You know, you have to plan like months ahead, sometimes even years ahead, right? So come up with your own personal settlement plan, right? Um, to say, I mean, UK, this is where I am today. You know, if you are doing a master's program, even if you've just started a master's program, you should already be thinking two, three years ahead. Because that's the only way, for example, you can begin to do the right things that would position yourself for success. You know, if you've started a master's program, already you should start looking into the job markets to figure out, you know, where are the locations with the right kind of jobs for your program or for the area where you have expertise. You know, what sort of companies are issuing the certificate of sponsorship? You know, how do you get in touch with recruiters? How do you structure your CV? How do you even interview? Because again, all these things take time, right? So the biggest advice I can give you is do a lot of research into the various settlement options that exist if you're already in the UK, and then just have a plan, right? And of course, with uh, if you're spiritual, with prayer and with hard work and dedication, you would succeed. Thank you for that. And uh, for me, I'll just say also that, yeah, Emigrate is able to coach on some of the things that you can do, both for getting the tech enabled visa pathway and also being able to get certificate of sponsorship or also other pathways for settlement. One of the things we can advise students to do is if you can plan over a two year period, you can qualify for global talent visa, particularly under exceptional promise. That's the maximum time you need if you do the right things from day one, right? Some people can, can qualify within one year. Some people already have some things that would make them qualify. And so you just want to top that up over a six-month period and all of that. And yeah, Emigrate helps with those kinds of roadmap, with also unloading to say these are the next things you need to do, appear in the newspaper, speak at events, all of those kind of things. So we offer the whole coaching 
and um, and holding services that that needs and this is by coaches who are also able to commit their time to help you succeed as they have succeeded um one of the things i would say in closing for this edition is that there's a lot of information out there already and many of them is available for free start with those things start with the free information that you can get readily available to you a lot of the, it is available whether you are in the category of beginner whether in a category of intermediate or advanced people or people ready to apply or even people looking for pathways to settlement but you need to invest time you need to invest time in that research you need to invest time in some of the things that are available from an immigrate perspective a bunch of videos are available where different coaches have shared their perspective they have shared their experience some of them may sound contradictory but by the time you start looking at everything people are saying you will start building a trend and you start building a trend for yourself today we were speaking with a product leader somebody who has built products and has serious experience we've spoken with software developers we've spoken with people building fintech medtech we've spoken with people who were beginners just a month or two um sorry just a year or two before and then also have been able to show themselves as exceptional over a period of time from an immigrate perspective once you've consumed those free resources then your next step is that you can book coaching sessions so we do a bunch of free coaching sessions and i did mention that we did have something extra for you if you waited till the end and it's this that because you've waited till the end normally we only give access to one free coaching session per person but because you waited till the end of this session you actually can get access to a second free coaching session you can do with that what you will uh, but what we advise always is that please do your research and come to those coaching sessions so you are making the best use of the coach's time by asking specific question that is personal to you, not that you come to ask questions that you could easily have just Googled <laughs> to, to answer that. Uh, we have several coaches uh, on the platform and we are actually building this out, Emigrate, as a platform where you can connect with coaches. So think of us as the Uber for take any good visa pathways and we are building that over a period of time on up until the point where it becomes its own digital product led innovation as well uh technician visa specifically a bunch of free resources that we shared during this session uh, you can go back in the video for you to take a look and say oh these are some of the free resources make the best use of those free resources as well uh, the link to this video has just been posted in the chat and that is going to be useful uh, for you final thing i would say is this please take action whatever level you are whatever category of the audience you are there's action that you need to take don't just take this information and do nothing with it you will not be different from the people that didn't attend the session really. You just had the information and did nothing with it. Instead, think about what are my next steps? What are the things I need to do? Do I need to book an emigrate coaching session right away? It's free of charge. Is that something I need to do right away so that I don't forget? Do I need to go and read the information that they said I should read? Then maybe I want to bookmark that and start from there. Do I want to draw a roadmap for myself to say I, I need to qualify for this thing within the next one year, within the next one month, within the next two months, within the next two years, whatever it is, take action. If you're already qualified, you need to start thinking about, okay, what documents do I have? Who are going to be my recommenders? Who are going to be the people that can write for me? What kind of document can I start downloading? Oh, they didn't give me a letter of invitation for a speaking event that I had. Can I call them to say, please, I need that letter of invitation and, and all of that. The key point is this, that there is action that you need to take regardless of what level you are. If you're a beginner, then you should be taking action around gaining exposure, starting somewhere, even if it's within your office, offer to speak there because you never know. Somebody might see you speaking within your office and say, oh, yeah, come and speak in a, a bigger stage. That's how some of these things happen. If you're an intermediate, you need to start contributing back to your ecosystem. You need to start mentoring other people. Don't say you are too young for you to start mentoring. If you're advanced, then you want to start doing the right thing. You want to assess 360 degree your profile to say, oh, maybe I haven't spoken enough in events. Maybe I haven't contributed enough. Maybe I haven't built myself enough. Maybe I haven't put myself out there enough. If you feel that you're qualified for this visa type, 
technician visa, the O-1 visa, and several other visa types that we've spoken about, if you are interested in relocation, then you want to then start th thinking about the application process itself, get as much information as possible around the application process, a lot of information out there, and also people willing to help in terms of the application process. And then there's an action that you need to take. And that's the last word I will say today, which is this, take action and take action now. Thank you so much for joining us during this edition. And we ask that you have a lovely rest of the day. Today, we want to say a big thank you to you as well, because uh, thank you for sharing your time. This has been really, really useful. We've gone beyond our typical time allocation, and I think we had a fantastic conversation today. As I said before, take action.